Hi, and thank you for joining us here for another video brought to you by plcgurus.net. So hopefully you've been following along in our Studio Essentials video series. Today what I wanted to look at is uh, the different types of tasks that we can configure. Uh, specifically, today I want to look at the periodic tasks. So, so far, we've been working in what's called the continuous task which is the default main task here. And we know this because of this little uh, circular arrow here, okay? So there are other types of tasks in the controller. So Logix controllers have three task types, continuous, periodic, and event. And today we're gonna look at periodic. But let's just run through the three different task types. So continuous runs at the lowest priority of any task and can be interrupted by any other task. The continuous task is designated by a folder with a circular arrow, just like this, and there can be a maximum of one continuous task in the controller. Okay, so periodic tasks execute at regular intervals and can be assigned different priorities. It is designated by a circular blue clock symbol, as you can see here on the screen. There can be multiple periodic tasks in any given controller project. Okay. And the last one is the event task. So triggers on a specific event. So this allows code to execute as quickly as possible when some event happens. For example, accounting instruction can quickly be executed whenever a photo eye turns on to get an accurate count of parts. Okay, so that's the rundown of the three different task types available to you in a Control Logic Studio 5000 environment. And again, today we're going to focus on the periodic task. Okay, so for before we get started with creating our periodic tasks, I want to introduce you to something uh, new here. So you can see we currently have the continuous main task, and inside of that we have our one program, main program, and inside that we have our main routine. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I want to remove this task and program completely. Okay, but I don't want to delete this main program just in case I may need to use it later. Okay, so what we can do is right click the task, properties, program phase schedule, and I want to go ahead and remove this so it's no longer scheduled to run on the CPU. So I'm going to click apply, click OK, and notice now my main program appears under the unscheduled folder icon here. Okay, great. And the main task is now just sitting there empty. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this main task by right-clicking, delete. And now I'm going to go ahead and create two new periodic tasks. So I'm going to go ahead and just collapse this and just get it out of the way. And so now I'm going to right-click my task folder, click New Task. And I'm going to call this task Periodic Task one and I want to under the type hit this little drop down and you can see here all of my different task types are listed so I'm gonna go ahead and select periodic task and now I have the ability to set the period that I want this task to execute so at what interval do I want this task to execute I'm gonna set the priority uh, what priority does this task have over other tasks in my controller and again here it tells you the lower number yields a higher priority and the watchdog Okay, so for this task, I'm going to go ahead and set the period at one second or a thousand milliseconds. And you know what? We're not going to play with priority or watchdog. We're going to leave the default settings for now. And I'm going to click OK. Okay, so there you go. You see I have a periodic task uh, now scheduled to run on the CPU under my task directory. And I know it's a periodic task because of the circular blue clock symbol here. Okay, so let's carry on and create our second task. So I'm going to call this one periodic task two and same workflow periodic. And this time let's give this a period of two seconds and I'm going to click OK. OK, so you can see now we have two periodic tasks um, in schedule to run on our controller, but we have no programs yet. So let's go ahead and get started creating some programs in this these periodic tasks. So let's close this down. We don't need this ladder logic anymore showing. So I'm just going to click the little close sign here, not this one, but the lower one here to close this routine off. And now I'm going to go ahead and right click my periodic task one click and add new program. 
So let's give this new program a name and let's call it testing the concept one. And the description, schedule, and periodic tasks, we're going to leave that the way it is. Uh, the parents, we're just going to leave that to none and click OK. And you can see now we have a program there, but we have no routine in that program. So let's go ahead and create a routine in this program in this periodic task. And so we'll do the same workflow, right click, add new routine. And let's call this, I don't know, go one. Okay. And you can see here it's a ladder diagram type and in program or phase testing the concept one. And that's exactly what we want. So you can see it does follow this hierarchy um, of parent, child, uh, sub-child type nodes, okay? So you have to follow that hierarchy when you're deleting or adding any program, task, etc. Okay, so same workflow. Let's add a new program to periodic task two. And I'm gonna call this testing the concept two. Again, scheduling and periodic task two, clicking OK. And now I'm going to go ahead and right click, add a new routine, and we're going to call this one go to. OK, good. So let's go ahead and start building some logic in go one. So I'm going to double click that and I'm going to add. Um, well, we're going to do something here that really drives home the concept of periodic tasks. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up two inputs. And we're going to write to those inputs from two different routines in two different programs at two different scan intervals. And effectively, what we're going to be creating is a race condition. So this is something that you don't typically want to do in a production environment. Um, but I think as for driving home the concept of periodic tasks, I think it's going to serve us well. Okay, so let's go ahead and add some input and output instructions. And you know what? I'm going to show you something that you can do in this platform of controller that you can't do on the previous platform, the Slick 500 uh, MicroLogix type series platform, if you're familiar with that. So this concept is known as interlacing inputs and outputs. Typically, in older or legacy type controllers, all of your OTE instructions had to go to the right and all your input instructions had to go to the left. In the Control Logic Studio 5000 platform, this is no longer the case. We can go ahead and interlace our inputs and outputs. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, I'm going to create, I'm going to assign new IO to these guys um, that we haven't used yet. And if you haven't watched the video on aliasing, I do recommend that you, you do do that. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new tag. I'm going to call it a maintained selector switch. And again, it's going to be of type alias. And it's going to be an alias for this time. Let's go to, I don't know, let's pick an input point on our simulated IO module. I mean, you know what? I'm going to start at, uh, let's, you know what? Let's, let's pick 10. And I'm going to click on create. Okay. And this, this one, I'm going to go ahead and create a new tag for the output instruction. I'm going to call this one green light and it's going to be an alias tag again and this is going to point to our output module and let's make this guy output point 10 why not click create and on this guy I'm going to go ahead and create a new tag I'm going to call this a jog selector switch alias and this guy we will make 11 and I'm going a little quicker here because I'm assuming that you have watched the previous videos and I'm going to go ahead and create a new tag for this output we're going to call this one red light and again it's going to be an alias for output data point 11 okay and create okay so let's, this looks kind of funky if you're not used to this kind of intermixing of inputs and outputs, but let's read it through logically. So what this is saying is, if this input is true, this green light will turn on. To evaluate this instruction's true or false condition, it ignores any preceding output instructions and just looks at the input conditions. So it's looking at if this input is on and 
this input is on, then the red light will also be on, okay? So I hope that's very clear. So let's go ahead and compile this. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and put some logic in ladder two now, or in go to, sorry. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and add these guys. And this time we'll put them the way you would typically see them, I guess. And let's go ahead and just call up our maintain selector switch and our jog selector switch and our green light and our red light. Okay, good. And let's go ahead and finalize those edits as well. Let's just pull up go one again. So we're, the green light is dependent only on the input of the maintain selector switch being true to turn on. And in go two, the green light is looking for both the maintain and jog selector switch uh, to be true in order to be on, okay? So exactly what I was explaining before is we have two different programs, two different routines under two different periodic tasks that are scanning at two different intervals that have different preceding logic that are driving the same outputs. So you can imagine here, we are creating a very bad situation, um, but I want to show you the concept of the periodic task and how we can use the period to scan and write to those outputs. So in, in one rung, it could be true, and the other one, it could be false, okay? So I hope it's clear that what we're doing here is creating uh, a really an unstable condition in which um, these outputs are true or false in different places at different times. Okay, before we get going, I do want to pull up this little error screen. It did pop up earlier, but we didn't. Uh, I didn't draw your attention to it. So when we did go ahead and compile that and finalize all of those edits, you can see we have multiple errors or warnings in this case here. Um, that it popped up. So I'm just going to go ahead and pin that so it stays docked. And you can see here, the first warning, it says testing the concept two, program doesn't have an associated main routine. Okay, so it's very important that every single program in your controller project, and when I say program, we're talking about this level, not the task, but the program. So these two are what we would refer to as the program every program must have an associated main routine identified. And so how do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and do the first one. Um, I'm gonna right click on the program. I'm gonna click properties. And I'm gonna look at the configuration. And so notice I don't have any main routine identified. And it's important that we do do this because the CPU only scans one routine in each program. That is the main routine. And you can see here, go one is the only routine we have. That will be the main routine. So if we wanna have multiple routines or subroutines under any given program, we'll be required to use what's known as a JSR or jump to subroutine instruction to jump from the main routine to those subsequent subroutines, okay? So I hope that makes sense. So I'm gonna go ahead and fix that one. And it was complaining here about testing the concept two first, um, so let's go ahead and fix that one as well. So let's go ahead, same thing, properties, configuration, main routine, go to. Okay, so notice that when we we're assigning that main routine, notice that the ladder uh, symbol changed. It added this little one with the folded piece of paper here. So that is a quick identifier that that is the main routine in any in this program or this program, okay? So go one's main routine here, go two is main routine in this program. Okay, good. So now it also warned us about um, these OTE. It's saying duplicate destructive bit reference detected. And this is exactly what we're talking about. So the software is smart enough to know that what we are doing is not necessarily good practice. And like I say, we're writing to the same outputs from different routines at different scan intervals in our periodic task. So the software is just saying, hey, are you sure you wanna do this? Because this is gonna create a race and unstable conditions. And of course, we're saying, yes, let's do it. Okay, so I think we're sufficient now. Um, let's go ahead and just 
take a look and we're just going to run through and see if we've cleaned up any of those errors and we did so now the only thing it's complaining about is these destructive bits here okay and we're doing this intentionally so let's carry on okay so let's make something work here all right so we're in go to now i'm going to double click go one to go to that routine okay so let's go ahead and turn our maintain selector switch on by hitting our input 10 uh, here on the module properties of slot three so here we go so the green light should be on right now oh now it's on now it's off okay so you can see what's happening here is in this routine this green light according to this logic should be on all the time but what have we done in periodic task two that has a periodic scan of two seconds in go to we see that the logic is false because the jog selector switch is a condition for this green light to be on so effectively we have created a race condition so what's happening is every second this periodic scan is triggering it's making it true and then after two seconds after that in go to it's turning it off okay so we can see that very clearly the periodic scans are determining the state of this output because of what we've done here okay so let's go ahead and turn on the jog selector switch and see what happens so you can see here now the both the lights green and red are staying solid green here because they are both true in both rungs in both tasks you see that so they are both true here so let's go ahead and turn that jog selector off one more time and you can see the red light turns off and now the green light again is flashing on and off depending on which periodic task is triggered to scan and write to that output so i hope this is clear what we've done here so to summarize, I hope this example has driven home how periodic tasks work. But to summarize the use of periodic task is really when you start to optimize. I've seen too, far too often where uh, OEMs, machine builders will just dump everything, all of their program logic into the main continuous task. I've seen it where scan starts to become a major issue. So what we can do with periodic tasks is we can pluck out the non-critical pieces of machine logic out of the continuous tasks that don't need to necessarily run every single scan and thus optimize our CPU utilization so that we're not scanning logic that doesn't necessarily need to be scanned every single scan okay so we can put those things and we can start to optimize our controller projects and move those different pieces outside of the continuous task and trigger them only at the intervals that we need to trigger them so i hope that makes sense i hope you found this video informative if you have please give us a like subscribe to our channel and head on over to our blog and forum at https colon backslash backslash plcgurus.net. Thank you for watching.